The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat peer to peer. Hello. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. What's going on? Oh, just, um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I just drank some coffee and didn't do it right. <laughs> um, yeah, just watching all the news, man, watching all the craziness go down. Crazy. It's like one hit after the after the next, right? What's weird is that like we've kind of been talking about this for years. We've said, man, these are these are real problems with mixing. These are real problems just in, in general with creating an ecosystem that's based on intermediaries and third parties and whatnot. Even if custody isn't involved, the, the fact that profit is involved just seems to be like a carte blanche for these scumbags in government to come and, and find a way to attack you. Um, mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. kind of it's almost surreal uh, watching it happen because, you know, we, we've talked about it, but, but, you know, it's actually starting to happen. It's kind of like, fuck, <laughs> you start exactly. to realize, you know, um, there, there could be a lot of other problems that, that could be popping up that are that are difficult for us as well. Um, not that we haven't already experienced them with with the delistings and whatnot. But. Yeah, I mean, the, the samurai wallet thing is pretty shocking, but I think even more shocking is uh, in terms of like, wow, I can't believe that's actually happening. Uh, the lightning wallets, you know, lightning attack on lightning that we're seeing right with Phoenix uh, no longer offering services with this fear that you know, lightning nodes may be considered money transmitters as well. I mean, once again, these are things we've talked about, especially in Monero land. We, we've, we put out these warnings, but to start to see them come to pass is, is shocking. I'll be really excited to hear what, what Mike has to say from, uh, from the Tor law firm about like how liberally can they stretch <laughs> the scribbles regarding the legislative scribbles regarding money transmitters. I took a brief look at it um, earlier this week, and it seemed to me like that it, it involves custody. Like money transmission should involve custom custody, and money service businesses involve some kind of transfer custody. Um, but you know, I'm just a pleb, and I'm sure there's a lot more scribbles to read on that. So perhaps Mike can hope he can illuminate us on at least like what's the paradigm, the logic of the government, what kind of things are they going to bring to court. Um, you know, and uh, like for, for, for guys out there, like you should definitely 100% try to understand your opponent's argument and then you should try to understand it better than they do because um, that's your ability to defeat it. I mean, with Lightning, like LSPs do uh, move liquidity around. They provide you with liquidity. So like Breeze, yeah. well, they have a different company they use for liquidity. Phoenix Wallet, they are their own LSP. So they provide liquidity themselves. Um, I'm not sure about Wasabi Wallet. I don't, this was something about even do lightning or just regular Bitcoin with a mixer. I mean, our, our, our whole thesis all along, uh, those in Monero that really understand it has been that this stuff needs to be all built into the base layer. Uh, it needs to be just, you know, a true open source protocol, uh, every, all the privacy built into into the base layer that there can't be these tools that are used outside to obfuscate things because then they will be viewed as tools for those purposes. Things need to be default private and it needs to be considered a utility for transmitting money, not a utility for washing money. Uh, and that's kind of been the thesis all along as, as to why Monero is important. Uh, because it does all these things on the base layer and it's coming to pass and not to, you know, sound like I, I you know, we don't want to sound like I told you so, but I mean, uh, it's, it's very much been the thesis and you know, the, the law, why we're saying it is unclear. It is, it is quite clear in other ways. And that's why, you know, Monero does the things it does. Um, so we'll, we'll get into to all of that more, but I think, I think, you know, that, that meme needs to get out there more now, this realization, this larger realization as to this is why we Monero, this is why we moved away from Bitcoin. This is why, I mean, I, I'm not speaking for, for everybody here. This is why I don't use Bitcoin privacy tools. This is why I use Monero. It's default private. It's a, it's a utility for transacting value it's not owned or controlled by any person or corporation nobody is profiting from the use of it there is no dev tax it's like you know the protocols that run the internet itself and so if there's going to be an attack on that 
then there's an extreme blatant attack on free speech itself. Then at that point, you're saying, you know, code is not code is not speech. At that point, if you're attacking Monero uh, on that level and you're saying, you know, we're banning Monero because it's it's uh, being used for money laundering. At that point, you also have to ban Bitcoin um, or, you know, at that point, you're talking about banning encryption itself. I mean, Monero is 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 aligned with these basic tenants. And that's where the ultimate battle is going to be ta take place. And if we lose that battle, then America has, has essentially lost the battle in terms of what liberty is in this country. And, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the tenets that this country was found upon, the Constitution, we could go into all that. But that's really what it's going to come down to. Is, is Monero, can Monero legally be banned in, in the U.S.? And I personally don't think it can be. And if it can be, then the U.S. is no longer what, what it, anything close to what it was supposed to be. Yeah, well, I'll, I think it's already true today, but. I'll, I'll save some of my um, more sort of in the weeds questions, because I feel like with the way that they're going about trying to define money transmitter, um, you could define a node, anyone running a node, any miner, maybe not a node necessarily, but at least a miner. You could define any miner, any mining pool, any hasher, um as a money transmitter like with with as liberally as they're going um so uh but i'll i'll save i'll save that question for uh when we get the, the legal expert up on stage yeah we yeah so. we could get into that i mean i think perhaps an, an ln node is more arguably a money transmitter than a than a miner right i think you would you would agree to that mm. Mm. Eh, may i might not <laughs> in terms of qualitatively i i may or may not um but uh, yeah, I mean, we'll you know we can we can flesh that out later. Yeah, if wanna which is you know which weeds here right, and then that gets all into why why uh, random access is, is so important, why CPU mining is so important, because at that point, what are they banning? They're banning the use of a computer. Um, all all these things, all these things. But my overall well, they're arching they're point trying being to ban is, math right now. They're trying to to ban matrix algebra. Certain forms of matrix algebra will become illegal. Not really, but you know that's a. Uh, Effectively AI, right? That's what AI is. Your hmm. the simulation of these neural networks is all done with matrices and with I mean complex math, but it's just math. Um, and the government's sitting here talking about how do we regulate it, how do we stop it? Um, so we know what they want to do. We know the kind of mentality that these people have, um, which makes it even more incumbent that your protocol can survive these kinds of attacks. Um, and I think Monero really has the best chance of everything that we've seen so far has the best chance to be able to survive these kinds of attacks both from a legal perspective um, and also from a network perspective. Um, exactly. I think that it's, I think it's very telling that how, how did they attack Monero? They are sort of covertly behind the scenes talking to exchanges and trying to get them to delist it. But how are they attacking Bitcoin and the other ones? Well, there's, they, they took uh, tornado cash to court. They arrested the, the guys that had some like centralized focus point into the operation of, of that functionality. And even though it was just a peripheral functionality um, and not part of the core tornado cash functionality, same thing with um, with Samurai. Um, we noticed that Wasabi, they forced them to, I mean, we say forced, maybe they're, maybe they're feds, you know, secretly feds, honeypot. Maybe they're for real, right? How could we know? But we do know that Wasabi um, does cooperate with chain analysis and does, at least on their front end, um, they block bad boys. They block, they block bad UTXOs. Um, so I think it's very telling that they're doing the open upfront legal attacks on the points that they, that they can that are the most centralized, but they're not doing that with Monero. They've never even hardly mentioned trying to come after Monero in, in a direct legal assault. They're doing it in their little slimy back end ways um, by, by trying to, to force the corporate hand, the, the corporations and force their hand um, to, to delist. So I think that's very telling. Um, so Maybe we can uh, go ahead and get into price if you guys would like. Yeah, go, go, let's go ahead and get into price. Everybody's listening now. Please, please like and share. Let's let's get the word out. Let's try to uh, get as many viewers as we can for the you know for the upcoming conversation that we'll ha be having at around twelve noon when we bring on all today's special guests. Uh, obviously, with with Body and Tux and myself included. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Body, take it away, and we'll bring we'll be bringing up the special guests in about uh, forty minutes from now. I love how we can tell that everyone here is watching on like freedom platforms because we've got 72 watching and we've only got nine likes. So uh, mm -hmm. that probably means that people are tuning in through new pipe and, and other methods. So fuck yeah, guys. Right on. 
Um, okay, uh, we got the XMR USD chart right in front of us sitting here. Um, we'll get rid of the volume for a second. Uh, on the near term from since like February, you can see, so this this big red candle was obviously when they delisted Monero from Binance and, uh, you know, uh, swing traders or speculators are going to do what they do. And since then, we've kind of been in this holding pattern, just sort of um, a sideways triangle, it looks like. Um, in terms of the volume, one thing, this is the crack in price, by the way. One thing I noticed that's interesting here is that the volume shot up immediately on that delisting. Uh, and you'll notice that crack in volume has actually stayed pretty high since then. And that that looks a little bit different than the other volumes that we've seen from other exchanges. So um, let's see here. I don't know why it's not saying um, which is which. Okay, whatever. It, last night it was it was actually showing which exchanges. Here we go. Qcoin. All right. So this chart is Qcoin. Um, you'll notice that yeah, their volume shot up, um, but then it's kind of trailed off. Same thing with Max C. So Max C is kind of like an up and comer. Um, be very careful. Don't trust them. Um, they could very well freeze your funds, and they have, um, and they'll hold them hostage for KYC. Uh, something Binance uh, has done back in the day as well. So, but you'll notice also. Um, so again, th these vertical white lines right here, that's where price, uh, sorry, that's where the delisting happened. So the first white line is the announcement. And then the second white line is where Binance actually delisted uh, and that actually took place. So again, you'll notice that, yeah, there's there was some volume for a couple of days on MEXC, but then that came back down. Um, this is actually cracking right here. I just wanted to show that there for reference. Um, CoinX, uh, again, another <clears throat> kind of a new exchange here. They haven't been doing any volume. In fact, they've, their volume has been dropping off. Um, <clears throat> it does look like Bitfinex, <laughs> I don't trust, I trust Bitfinex least of all, but it does look like Bitfinex, um, I don't know how that line goes over there. This should be right here. It does look like Bitfinex volume, um, has allegedly come up some, uh, some, probably some of the inside cabal in crypto does need Monero and they need a way to get, get to it. <clears throat> For all we know, this <laughs> maybe this is how um, how the government covertly sells their Monero. I don't know. Just kidding. Um, and then uh, last one, we've got also CoinX, but this is USDC volume uh, relative to Monero. So again, it, it's fallen off. So the only exchange after the, the Binance delisting that has continued to have high volume would be Kraken. Uh, and that's that's come up and it's, it's basically stayed fairly high for the entire time since then. So um, I just thought that was interesting. Um, I do regard Kraken as being more likely to have uh, correct volume or um, not inflated, not wash traded volume. Probably they still have some, um, but I think that their volume re uh, reporting is probably more honest. But even so, um, even if like you would think if these guys were going to lie about their volume, that they would just like wash traded themselves higher and be like, hey, look, we're the new, we're the new Monero, Monero exchange. Um, anyways, one thing that I think this is potentially a sign of, uh, the fact that we don't have a whole lot of volume being reported by these extra, these other exchanges is that people are probably um, actually moving to other solutions, right? They're actually moving to decentralized solutions. Um, <clears throat> and we see, we're starting to see quite a few of them pop up. So it doesn't matter if they, well, let me rephrase. It does matter if they delist Monero from centralized exchanges, but they're almost kind of doing us a favor, guys. They're telling you that you need to be using these things in a way that's censorship resistant, that's decentralized, and much more difficult to attack uh, from, from a legal um, <clears throat> so one thing we can also take a look at, we always look at here is the, um, the price divergences. So this is relative to Kraken. And the reason that we do this is because Kraken has never shown signs to us that they have fractionally reserved Monero. They've never shut down withdrawals for longer than basically an hour. Um, whereas pretty much almost every single other exchange out there has shut down Monero for days at a time. Um, particularly during the most suspect moments, um, and during the highest price divergences. So they'll shut down their exchanges and then they'll diverge their price uh, significantly. So Kraken is the only one that didn't do that. And it seems like, you know, they're a little bit more regulated. They're the only US exchange, major US exchange that does a lot of volume um, and really global exchange that does a lot of volumes that, that lists Monero directly for fiat. Not for USDT, not for Tether, right? not for USDC, directly for, uh, for US dollars. And so... Because of sort of the totality over a few years of investigation that we've done just sort of independently, it does seem like Kraken has um, has been more honest and more reliable than the other exchanges. And so we compare these uh, we compare these guys' prices against Kraken because again, when when they shut down their withdrawals, when they freeze their withdrawals for days and sometimes weeks at a time, they diverge their prices below Kraken. And they even even exchanges that aren't frozen will diverge their prices down to match the uh, the, the frozen exchanges while Kraken price stays higher, which is just extremely suspect 
because you shouldn't have those kinds of price mismatches. You should be able to, that should be arbitrated very quickly by bots actually. Um, but if withdrawals are shut down, that arbitration can't happen, right? So you basically, you buy on the, you buy coin on the lower listed exchange and then you sell it on the higher listed exchange and that forces the price to equalize. But if exchanges are frozen, that price cannot equalize. And so this is why we look at the price divergences. Um, and so uh, <laughs> I say all that really to, to just show you here that that actually over the past week or so, um, pretty much everything is kind of, is back at the zero point. Um, even Poloniex. And <laughs> Poloniex, as we can see back here, has had a significant vacillation uh, up to the tune of minus 9% um, since, uh, well, going back for quite a long time, actually, for the month of March, uh, obviously. This chart is interesting. You'll notice that we're on a 15-minute chart here. Um, it it kind of just has to be that way um, because these guys try to hide their misdeeds in the noise. So they don't always necessarily keep their prices um, diverged. What they'll do is they'll keep them mostly diverged, but then they'll swing it a lot. So you take the moving average so that you can see what they're actually doing. Um, and so to do that, you need a fine resolution, uh, which is why we're on the 15 minute chart here instead of something like a, like a two hour or, or one day chart. Um, the, the, the simple fact is trading view doesn't provide us the data that we need to go back. Um, you know, let's just say, uh, 20,000 seconds, right? Cause if we looked on the second by second chart, that's real to look at anyways, um, kind of a long way of just saying, uh, right now it looks like the, uh, the price divergences are actually, um, not really present. They're very small. Um, this is basically noise, like minus 0.2% to plus 0.2%. Um, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't say that's anything uh, suspicious to, to point your finger at. Um, all right, so we'll take a look here at the XMR BTC chart. Um, and again, so basically for the month of April, for the last two weeks, um, I think last time we talked was about 10 days ago. Um, price uh, relative to Bitcoin has kind of just been oscillating here. Um, you'll notice all these colorful lines uh, that are drawn on the chart. These are all standard deviations. Um, the blue lines are upper standard deviations. The orange lines are lower standard deviations. And um, this is just overlaid of multiple time frames. So we, we're looking at like the uh, the 10 day, the 15 day, the 20, 50, 60, 100, 200, 500,000, 2,000, 3,000, et cetera, um, time frames, right? So they're all just overlaid on top of each other. Um, just consider them to be standard deviations uh, in sort of like a macro picture view here. Um, and then if you can see like these these light white lines, um, these are moving averages. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, potentially. But the point of this chart is basically that um, right right now, nothing nothing really is happening here with the XMR BTC price. Um, we're basically oscillating. I do like on the short on the short time horizons how um, price does seem to be establishing here into these lower standard deviations. So, that, that very well could be a sign that this is actually the bottom, bottom, bottom. We've been talking here for mm, maybe about the last, oh, we'll just say a month, maybe a month and a half, that uh, overall, like, yeah, this this delisting, uh, and obviously Bitcoin pumped pretty hard um, with the ETFs, and then, um, you know, we've got the halving hype and all that stuff. So, um, and then we had the delisting, so our relative price has significantly gone down, uh, which is unfortunate, right? Because... <laughs> Monero is the thing that's protecting people, for example, in, in uh, austere environments like the darknet markets. Um, Monero replaced Bitcoin in, in darknet markets. And that's no small feat. Like you, you really like it, it's hard to it's hard to overstate how significant that really is. The, the fact like for something to unseat the number one coin means that there must be something there, right? There's something important happening there. And of course, it's privacy. It's the ability for Monero to protect your privacy, fungibility, so that every coin looks like every other coin. Um, and so, anyways, it's unfortunate to have watched this uh, this drop off happen here. Um, but you know that doesn't stop Monero from working, and, uh, and and obviously we just keep on using it. And and the other thing too to keep in mind is that Monero's price, <clears throat> the price that we have, has been built on organic adoption. It's not been built on hype. It's not been built on narratives or um, you know asking the government to, <laughs> to to integrate our price into their into their financial system. This is built on the basis of real people actually using this thing uh, for for real use cases, and that's that's a lot more than can be said for for almost any other coin. Um, there are a few other coins out there, sure that that are also used for payments as well. Um, you know, even some OG coins, but um, most of this crap out there, most of this garbage that that outperforms Bitcoin even isn't used for for jack or for shit. Um, and and we've got Monero here that that is actually used and actually has demand. Um, and unfortunately, uh, just is, is not experiencing as much price performance as uh, all of us um, Moon Boy NGU convert uh, evangelists would prefer.
just kidding. Right. Um, we've <laughs> since learned. Did, um, did, did we see the, any the, any increase in volume or anything uh, after the samurai news and some of these other other stories that broke this week, or it was just like no no reaction at all? Uh, let's go to a shorter time frame here. Take a look at volume. No, I mean it, it doesn't look like it. Um, from oops, from the U.S. dollar price, it doesn't look like we had any major. So this is the four hour chart. <clears throat> so the samurai news would have dropped. Would have dropped right around here, I suppose. So we got maybe a tiny little, maybe it's just the tiniest little bump in volume right there. Maybe the tiniest little bump in price. Um, but I mean, I don't think we could really, um, I don't think we could really say that. That's so. just that's that is a little a little crazy to me, right? I mean, what, what's what's your take on that? Obviously, you know, I th I think we've become numb over here around here in Monero Land, where we're just like, oh, okay, price didn't move. But you know, if you take yourself out of for, out of it for a minute and you look at it, it's like it's a little shocking that there was like no reaction whatsoever. I mean, we we got this news that dropped that basically said, you know, privacy tools in Bitcoin uh, may not be around much longer uh, in the in the eyes of the federal government. Um, you might want to start looking at something like Monero, which is basically your private. And there was like zero response in the market. Um, I, I don't think it would be too surprising, to be honest. The people that were using Samurai are well aware of Monero. And it seems like the people in the Bitcoin community that, that didn't like Monero, they also hated Samurai. And none of those guys would have ever used Samurai anyways. Um, they were all using Wasabi or they probably just weren't using Wasabi, Wasabi or they were probably using Lightning Network custodially and thinking they were being private or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's being a bit cheeky, but that's just what I see out there when I talk to people on, on Twitter. Um, and I guess the overall analysis that, okay, this might mean that Bitcoin never becomes private or never has tools that make it private. If anything, that just plays more into the number go up where people are like, oh, okay, this is actually better for Bitcoin. Yeah, there's they seem to be a, somewhat of a minority in the Bitcoin ecosystem community. I don't see, I, I kind of see them... I, what I can't, what I see is a lot of gray area. Actually, I see people that don't want to go <laughs> compromise, obviously compromise their values that deeply to be like, "Yay, KYC! That means number go up." I see a few of them. Um, only a few people are that degenerate, truly um, <laughs> that messed up. The rest of them are kind of like, "Well, Monero's just going to get delisted, and Bitcoin is uh, private enough, uh, and and it's fungible enough, and and that's why it's integrating." And uh, Monero could never do that anyways. And so, yeah, and our number goes up and yours doesn't. Ha ha. Right. So I see a lot of that out there, but but I don't see people too much like, straight up just supporting KYC in the Bitcoin community. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, one thing I am seeing is it does feel like there's new people entering the conversation. There's new people that are asking about Monero. Um, some of them are, are Bitcoiners. Some of them um, maybe even were like maximalish, uh, maybe not like fully straight up laser eyed or. Uh, you know, maybe only half laser right. I don't know. But um, I, I am seeing more interest in Monero and I am seeing people saying, you know what, maybe I should get some. This is the kind of thing that might happen slowly, right? It, um, In fact, it might even be better if it happens slowly. If we just get some mad rush influx, that could be a hype thing. That could be a speculative thing. That could be people not really stopping to take the time to think about what they're doing. Um, so, you know, it's like the fat lady hasn't sung on that. I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't worry about it. In fact, with all of this news that's happening and, and just kind of like I'm seeing just the very beginnings of that interest start to develop, I think there's a reasonably good pos uh, possibility that we do see more people entering the Monero ecosystem specifically for the privacy. So, you know, one can hope. Hopefully that's that's what we see. Um, but, you know, let's uh, let's uh, pivot here a little bit to Bitcoin um, since, you know, Bitcoin is, is uh, one of the big news stories here. And, and uh, it's obviously more than 50 percent of the total crypto market cap. So right here, we're looking at the Bitcoin regression analysis. Um, just like to occasionally touch on this. Um, obviously, this is the lifetime Bitcoin chart. We're looking at monthly candles here. The red line is the blow off tops. The green line is like the absolute um, highest deviation from the model. Uh, and then the blue line is sort of the non bubble data. So what we do is we remove these blow off tops uh, and we like sort of progressively chop the higher data until we arrive at this green line here, um, which is sort of like the green line is like sell the farm, sell your house, buy Bitcoin. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're probably going to do pretty good in terms of a uh, speculative investment. So let's uh, zoom in here a little bit to the daily and just kind of get our bearings on, on where we at, uh, where we are at, uh, 
just in terms of a relation to the blue line. So basically you want to DCA below the blue line. Um, and then you want to DCA out of Bitcoin when you start to approach the red line. And you'll notice like, this is actually right here. This is actually within 1% of the top, um, back in, uh, back in April of 2021. So we are actually a little bit above that blue line right now. We're like, we're decently, you know, I'd say we're, we're decently above it. That doesn't mean, um, j just, just by the way, guys, this doesn't mean that Bitcoin is, is going to the red line post haste, right? The Bitcoin has pullbacks of 30 to 40% sometimes in a bull market. And if things were to drop, let's just go from the top here. If things were to drop 40%, that could take us down to 40, 41,000. And by the way, if we go back here and we check what happened in, um, in March of 2020, right? So if we're, if we're thinking in terms of the four year cycle, uh, which somehow matches the presidential election cycle, but, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not making any conspiracy accusations on that. That's just funny. Just like a, a side, a side note. Anyways, March of 2020, we touched this green line. In fact, this point down here is a defining factor for this green line. We we derived the green line from um, this point, among others, um, uh, as being like one of the highest deviations from the regression model, from the best fit line. So the point is that, um, yeah, even after making crazy mad gains uh, in, in from 2019 to 2020 to the tune of 4x, which is about what we've done here, um, things still crashed significantly and touched that green line. And if stock markets, uh, if the rest of the, the macro markets out there have some kind of like major problem and the scene is set for this to develop, it doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow, but we'll look at the macro in a second. The scene is set. It could happen. So just be prepared, right? Keep, keep some, um, uh, keep some dry powder, right? Keep some, some funds ready to buy. You typically want to have a little bit of cash on hand that you, that you could spend if need be. So I do think right now, like the lowest possibility would be the screen line. 25,000 would be sort of the absolute low. That's a, that's a buy with leverage kind of moment. Um, <clears throat> you know, maybe it happens in the future. So maybe it happens at something more like 30,000. But at any rate, um, this, this chart doesn't tell you which direction to expect to go first. It just tells you where the boundaries are. And it tells you where you are relative to like just um, overall performance. So um, just thought you guys might find that interesting. Uh, let's take a look at the, this is also the same chart, believe it or not. These are, these are the same chart here, um, in terms of the regression analysis. It's just that, um, the, uh, the, the zero point here is effectively the blue line. So right here, this, uh, this dotted line, maybe we'll just make that blue to make it more clear, uh, what that is. So this is the blue line. This is basically if you subtract price from the model. And so you'll notice we're, we're decently above the model at the moment. Um, <clears throat> in the past, we've been like significantly above the model, but you can see that this is curving down. So, um, we won't get too much into the weeds into the math here. Hypothetically, if we touched this line right here, that would be about 140,000. Um, and you'll notice over here, it's it's the same right here. If we were to go to the all-time high, like or to the to the edge, the outer boundary, right to the edge of the max possible price, um, that would be 144,000. Yes, I know. Um, for anyone out there that's like, that's just math and statistics. You can't tell you fundamentals. Yes, I know that. Um, <laughs> we're not we're not saying that this is a magical chart. We're just saying that this thing right here is statistical in nature, and it does help us to inform our decisions, um, to make better decisions, uh, and to know when to buy, and maybe, maybe when to DCA out. So um, this is Bitcoin versus the NASDAQ, and uh, I like this chart because one of the things, when, when it comes to inflation, one of the things you need to do is not just beat inflation, because, I mean, basically everything beats inflation over long time frames. Um, you need to keep up with the other main assets that are benefiting from that inflation. And the NASDAQ is one of the primary assets. It's not really an asset, but one of the primary um, environments, let's just say, right? Stocks, tech stocks. That is what benefits from the inflation. You get these big companies, mega corporations, they take loans. Those loans are printed from nothing. Um, they go out and spend that into the economy. The GDP goes up and their stock price goes up. Um, so they're like the primary first beneficiary of this, infl uh, th this inflation of printed money. And so your asset, if you want to beat inflation, your asset needs to keep up um, with uh, with the stock market, basically, because otherwise you could just buy the stock market. And so, you know, <clears throat> happy times for the last, um, oh, we'll just say year, year and a half. Uh, Bitcoin has been keeping up with the stock market. In fact, it's overperformed it to the tune of about um, two and a half X. So still looking, uh, haven't broken all time highs in terms of the stock market. That's fine. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't be too worried about that. You'll notice these kind of uh, big pleb lines here that I've drawn. Um, Pleb lines are really basically just there. <clears throat> well, they, they do a few things for us, but they are visual reference points. Um, and they work, especially if they're big um, headliner pleb lines, because they, they work because other people draw the same lines and, and they think it works, right? So you have markets are, are obviously an aggregate of a lot of things, one of which is the pleb action. 
um, and people um, buying and selling um, and, and plebs buying and selling. So if you see resistance or support, um, plebs tend to like to buy on these lines. That's why I call them pleb lines. Just just keep in mind um, they're useful up to a point um, and you can't just like you can't regard them. It's just like a statistical analysis we talked about uh, just a second ago. It's useful. Just understand its limitations. Anyways, um, so yeah, Bitcoin here is kind of sitting in this um, consolidation pattern. Oh, well, that's an artifact of dividing by the NASDAQ is why that happened. Let's just stick to the daily. Um, yeah, Bitcoin is sort of consolidating here at this range. Uh, I'm not I'm not entirely sure that I like. Uh, I would like to say that it's it's um, going to go up or down here. I'm not, I don't want to make any predictions in that regard. One thing that I forgot to mention to you guys, I wanted to talk about the Bitcoin monthly closes. Um, let's zoom this chart back in. Sorry, taking a step back here. Okay, so one thing that has happened here over the past, uh, really since January, we have had one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven green monthly candles. That only happened one other time in Bitcoin's price history, and that was way, way, way back here, like at the very, very beginning. Um, so you'll count here, one, two, three, four, five, uh, sorry, wrong, wrong one, wrong one, uh, right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't exactly like to count these two little guys because this was the start of an uptrend and technically these guys closed in the green, but I mean, the difference there in these candles is tiny, tiny, tiny. Um, so technically it was seven green candles, but in reality, it wasn't like the seven green candles that we just had here, right? These were, these were actually for the most part, all green with a slight break, uh, in the middle there, but this, this came in the middle. So one, the thing that I really wanted to point out to you guys today is, um, I don't like, I don't like that we haven't broken the all-time high with momentum. So if we go back and we look at previous breaks of all-time highs, for the most part, they were broken with momentum, right? So you get to the, your monthly close happens at the previous monthly close, and then you break to the upside. Um, and yes, technically we did set new, new higher highs. Um, we ecked out some marginal higher highs to the tune of about six, 7%. Uh, and then April looks like it looks like we're going to close down unless Bitcoin just takes off on Monday and Tuesday, which given the current news environment, I'd say that's probably a dubious proposition. But let's go ahead and take a look at like previous breaks of the all time high. So here we go. Uh, 2020, um, we touched that all time high and then we broke with momentum and then we kept moving. Right. Um, the other the other time, the other previous time that we broke the all time high um, was right here uh, back in 2017. Um, sorry, right here. So we kind of touched it. There was a little bit of resistance for a moment, but then we broke that with momentum and then just kept going. Um, then same thing, we can look back right here. Uh, basically broke through the all-time high with momentum and kept going. Right now, I, I'm not saying this to top guys. I'm not top calling here, but I am telling you that you should be cautious because we did pull back here in April after breaking the all-time high, after breaking the monthly all-time high. Um, you really need a green candle. You really need to, to close the May candle that's coming up here. Um, that needs to close at, at reasonably higher levels. Like let's just say 80,000, right? We want to see that thing actually close at 80,000. Cause in my mind, this is not yet a confirmed like actual bull market in the sense that we're breaking all time highs and we're headed for this upper boundary. We're headed for 150, 200,000, um, it could very well be that some major pullback needs to happen here for, for some period of time. Uh, it does feel like there's a lot of hype that's gone on with the having. Um, it does feel like, like the ETF and everything just overall, like there's just been so much hype here and it could be that a lot of those gains were front run. It could be that, um, that, that the reality is that perhaps absent those things, this market just needed time to slowly kind of move up, move up, move up before we get that spike. It feels like a lot of that was front run, which makes sense. Markets learn. Everybody knows the four year having cycle in Bitcoin now. So, um, yeah, I guess, uh, I, uh, I'm just saying, be, be careful. Don't, don't just, uh, don't think, okay, we hit the all time high. That's it. We're, we're going, we're going for the moon here. Um, you just gotta be really careful, especially like, okay, if you're, if you're just DCAing, then, then fine. But a lot of people see that and then they start doubling down and DCAing even more at the top or during a local high. And then, you're, you know, you're going to get wrecked and you're going to learn the time value of money for a period of time um, before you get that back. And that, that can be painful. It especially can be painful if you put funds that you can't just let sit there for two to three years. When you invest money into something and then you bought the top and then it goes down and then life hits you and you need to get money. And you're like, well, I guess I have to sell my, my crypto now. And then you're selling at a loss. Like that's crushing. You could have just kept that in stupid fiat in a bank account and been better off. So I'm just saying, be careful when you DCA, especially when you DCA after mad gains have already happened, 
you don't want to get caught at the top and you don't especially don't want to get caught with the realities of life seeing you having being forced to sell at a lower price um so that's that's just like money management that's a little bit of a money management tip there uh okay let's uh let's take a little look at some degeneracy here um hey where did my degeneracy go mm -hmm. all right let me find it i swear that i had this pulled up oh uh, what do i call it z crypto plus it's even named like degeneracy okay here we go these are all like the boomer these are the boomer degenerate coins right so, so we've got um we've got dog uh we've got ripple we've, we've got binance shitcoin uh we have link which actually i think um does does actually do some things one thing that's interesting about link is it, it kind of tends to often um overperform first before major moves in the market happen so lately i've kind of been looking to link to tell me um, when when a major move is about to start um, in the in the broader markets. So, uh, anyways, the point of this chart: nothing has happened. BNB had a little excursion here to the top. They had a lovely uh, field day going uh, going off solo for a moment. I guess that only lasted for well, less than a week, basically a week. Uh, and now they seem to be coming back down. Um, something in my brain doesn't like that in the broader like in a broader analysis but uh, we won't we won't dive into that anyways that's shit coins for you these are oh sorry guys these are z scores um z scores are basically a way of comparing assets that perform they have different volatility assets that have different prices um it's a way of sort of normalizing them all to a zero point and saying okay how are they performing relative to their own past history um z scores are like a very fundamental thing that we use in statistics to um to to understand and, and compare against um just just different charts that are otherwise would be might be difficult to compare against and to tell when something is out of trend. Uh, okay, so this is Bitcoin dominance. It does look to me. So yeah, but Bitcoin dominance has been good. It's been on the up and up. I feel like this chart is starting, starting to just roll over a little bit. Um, you know, I'm not calling again, I'm not top calling here. This chart does it has kind of like this bullish feel to it. Um, and you'll notice that we've got the wave magic turned on again. Um, the blue lines are upper standard deviations, and the purple lines are sort of like a derivation of that. They're like higher than the upper standard deviation. Again, these are statistical metrics. Humans in aggregate are really good statistical machines. Um, we could talk about that more someday, but I think overall markets in general know when something is trending. And so this is just a visualization for us to understand when is something actually out of trend? When is it trending higher? When is it sort of occupying that, uh, that uptrend level? It's another way of looking at that other than just drawing, you know, stupid, dumb pleb lines. It's a statistical way of looking at that. So, um, technically you would look at this wave magic and say, okay, everything is still uptrending, right? You, you've got the, the, the upper standard deviations in blue still have an upslope to them. And price, uh, at least the, the Bitcoin dominance, has been basically um, riding those upper lines. At the moment, things fell out of the uh, out of the sort of rising wedge structure. It, it's an ish structure. It's not a perfect rising wedge, but it fell out of that structure. It's been riding the underside of it, tried to get back up in here, wicked into that area, and then fell back down. So right now, any any movement, any potential movement that happens on the Bitcoin dominance that brings us down here is going to roll these blue lines over, and that's typically that's typically a sign that um, that the major move is done with, right? And this is a move that, is, that has happened for the last year, right? So it's been 12 months. It's getting a little bit long in the tooth here. Um, just know that Bitcoin dominance may, it may be experiencing some resistance. Um, there's also this line right here, this dotted line. That shit goes all the way back to um, like the, the last beginning of the last bull market um, right here. So that that's where, uh, you know, it's a natural point. Oops, that's a natural point to draw the horizontal resistance. So... Um, next thing we're going to finish off here with just looking at the macro very quickly. Um, we don't exist in isolation. Bitcoin markets, mineral markets, everything exists. Um, everything exists with uh, in the broader context of inflation, printing, governments, um, you know, money markets, stuff like that. So we'll start with the dollar index just because that's that's an easy place to start. Everyone basically knows what the Dixie, the DXY is. Uh, we've been talking about this um, probably on its way here to the upper standard deviations for a while now. Um, it looks like this, there, there was a little bit of a cool off period here for, for the dollar index. This looks right now a little bit like a bullish flag. You can notice this last green candle um, that happened on Friday. If this thing breaks right here, and I, I know I'm drawing yellow lines, but you could, you could hypothetically just draw pleb lines, right? We could just draw them like that. Um, but yeah, as soon as this thing breaks to the upside, I would, I would expect Dixie, I would expect that momentum to carry it uh, here into the upper standard deviations, where somewhere in that general zone will will probably be found some resistance. Um, this is where, you know, this is getting pretty, pretty high, not quite as high as when Dixie just like mega, right, mega pumped um, to, uh, you know, at the 
in the depths of the bear market in 2022. Um, so again, this is the kind of thing we were saying that, that volatility is compressing on the dollar index. We should expect at some point this thing will break to one side or the other. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to say which way I want it to break. If we break to the upside, well, that probably means that inflation is going to be a little bit more contained. Um, and if it breaks to the downside, that means we're going to get mad gains and mad gains help me, but they hurt. Mm, well, they hurt anyone else that doesn't have coins and stuff that goes up a lot in value that doesn't know how to play that game. So, um, anyways, yeah, just, uh, that's the Dixie. Um, it tends to be inversely correlated with risk on. So if Dixie is rising and it's been rising, that means that all the risk assets like NASDAQ and crypto are they're they're more likely to suffer problems in their price. And if Dixie goes down, that usually is a sign that um, that things are going to be going up. So um, another along that same vein and a very, very important chart is the reverse repos. Reverse repos are when institutions, not you or me, but institutions park money with the Federal Reserve overnight and they get the federal funds rate for doing so. Um, that's money that's not doing anything. It's just parked with the Federal Reserve. It's highly liquid because they can pull it out the very next day and invest it in something, but um, it's money that is not going anywhere. So this was the the entrance into the bear market was seeing a lot of money getting parked with the Fed, and that money had to come from somewhere. So right now, this bull market has probably in large part been motivated by the $2.5 trillion down to uh, down to half a trillion dollars, right? So we're looking at about $2 trillion of money came out of reverse repos. And that money went somewhere. Most likely it went into stocks. It went into risk. It's seeking yield. It's seeking more than 5% yield. And with uh, the way that stocks and crypto have performed, well, obviously we've had better than 5% gains. So as long as there is mana to give, juice to squeeze from the reverse repos, I still tend to think that um, you know the markets could plausibly um, continue to go up. Now there's not much... I do wonder if they're saving some of that firepower for the election um, in the case that they want to put Biden back in. Maybe they don't want to put Biden back in. I hope they do. <laughs> we won't talk about that. But basically, a fraudulent fraudulent election is the best way for people to uh, to, to realize that that they need to disobey the government. And that's the only way we get out of, of any of this bullshit is we, we have to disobey the government. Sorry. Um, no, sorry, not sorry. Not, I'm not even not sorry. <laughs> so anyways, um, OK, gold here. We're looking at gold. Um, let's go to the weekly. Gold broke this very long-term rising wedge, something we've been expecting for talking about for a long time. And it's such, it's such a long pattern. You know, you talk about it every week and you're like, it's going to happen. <laughs> We're waiting for it to happen. It finally happened. Um, kind of really hoping that gold can make it all the way up here to uh, to that line. That's about 10%. Um, that upper boundary you'll see there is just really, really connecting the 1980 high to the 2011 high. Um, so that's a very large rising wedge. Um, I would hope that we can make it all the way up there or at least get close um, maybe we'll turn on the wave magic here and, and see what that tells us about where we are. Um, yeah, so we're actually, gold is actually pretty high. In fact, typically speaking, um, let's go to the daily. Typically, getting to these purple lines here, uh, that's, I mean, that's really, that, that that's, you would almost say that's getting out of control. I would say just based on that, my guess is that if gold's going to make it up here to this line, it's probably going to need to do it in some kind of fashion like that, right? Maybe something like that. Uh, again, that's totally speculative, guys. Like markets unfold in very unique ways. You can't just look at some lines and, and think that the uh, the past analysis, the statistical analysis, whatever, like that's not going to tell you necessarily where price is going. Markets are composed of a lot more factors than just that. Um, let me see. There was like one other thing I thought we needed. Oh yeah, bonds. Obviously, bonds. So we look at the bonds every week because this is going to be our our bellwether. This is going to be our canary in the coal mine in case there's a big tail risk event. In other words, a market crash. Everyone gets scared. Everyone sells at the same time. The institutions, you know, whatever leverage unwinds. Um, this is a chart that should hopefully give us a little bit of advance warning. I am slightly concerned that because markets learn, um, this chart might not give us hardly any warning. We should see the signs. Um, we should we should see. Um, the yield curve inversion, the red lines are, are the overall yield curve inversion of the bond market. We should see this thing get to the zero point. Um, and when, if, and when this thing starts spiking up, that's, that's really dangerous territory. The other thing that we would hypothetically see is that bonds would start, um, rolling off, rolling down. Um, and particularly they would be below the federal funds rate. And you'll notice they already are below the federal funds rate, but really what we're looking for is violent moves in the bond market, violent moves in the bond market signal to us that there, um, that there really could be that people are scared, that institutions are moving, they're preparing. Um, and so that's why we look at this chart every week. Right now, um, nothing nothing really notable here happening. Um, just, just the slow roll, the slow trend, the slow movement in the direction of 
um, some kind of tail risk event happening. But I wouldn't I wouldn't be calling for that here in the near future. Um, I would be looking, you know, months down down the road here, maybe later this year, maybe later next year. Um, but we look at this chart every week just because, you know, we got to keep our bearings. We got to make sure that uh, we're looking at the stuff that's important um, and and not missing anything. So um, uh, I think that's about it. The Fed has a Federal Reserve has a meeting next week. I think I don't have good reasons to say it, but my intuition says that this meeting will probably be slightly ever so slightly more important um, than, than the previous meetings. Maybe, you know, why I probably say that is because the NASDAQ, um, or the stock market just in general seems to have done a little bit of rolling over. Um, it seems to have kind of topped out just a little bit. So, um, basically, uh, you'll, you'll notice that again, drawing pleb lines right here, but, um, there was kind of this very clear, and this is the weekly chart right here. There's this very clear way to just connect, you know, these two lines right there. And then, and the stock market just capped out there. Um, the other thing that you'll see on the S&P is that it was occupying this fairly narrow band, and it was actually quite a sharp increase. So if we scroll back here, um, if we scroll back here to the uh, the 2020 and 2021 bull market, we're just going to take this line here with the, this this upward channel that um, the S&P had occupied here for the last couple of months, um, re really for the last six months. Um, and we just slide this over here. You'll notice that that's a steeper curve than really almost any time during the bull market that happened in 2020 and 2021 for stocks. So, um, yeah, I mean, that things were things were really moving. Like there was a lot of um, bullish movement here on stocks and things have kind of um, pulled back and, and taken their time. So it wouldn't surprise me if uh, if J-Pow gets up there and starts saying talking a little bit more about the possibility and the data driven reasons for lowering the, the federal funds rate. Right. They, they speak in these like cryptic lawyer ways and they've got to because like the markets hang on their every fucking word. They're like, oh, my God, what is, what is Jay Powell going to do? He's going to lower rates when he's going to lower rates. Oh, my God, I need my, my cocaine fix. And so that's that's like the markets do that. So they've like they kind of have to talk in this like very lawyer droll um, way. And they have to like sort of indicate things rather than actually saying them half the time. So um, one thing I did want to point out here and the last thing we'll point out here is um, this is the wave magic on. Um, again, wave magic just being the standard deviation analysis. You'll notice. Um, so we had talked about um, as we were breaking these blue lines and on our way up here. I said, listen, we're probably headed for these purple lines. That's that's where the markets are headed over very long time frames. That's actually um, the stock market loves, to, and we won't take a look at it today because uh, we're a bit long already here uh, on the price report. But um, the stock markets do like to to basically maintain um, or at least touch these purple lines regularly on the way up. So, anyways. Um, yeah, we did finally make it into that zone. Things are pulling back here. Um, it, it, to me, this is no man's land. I wouldn't be able to tell you where we're going down here or we're going up. Maybe we're going up and then we're going down. Um, probably a lot might might depend on what J-Pal says next week. And and it wouldn't surprise me if the markets just kind of remain flat. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, that's what we're looking at here, guys. Um, let me see. I haven't checked the YouTube comments. I'm so bad about that. Was there any big YouTube comments that, uh, that uh, maybe I should respond to you guys? uh nothing really uh directly price related um okay wait here's i don't know if, if you can make sense of this one anyone else here a pending u.s legislation that limits crypto liquidation profits to a thousand cap per year uh i haven't heard about that I'm not sure no i don't that's probably a sense. misinterpretation of um yeah i don't know something that they're right because they're talking about doing um capital gains or yeah taxing your your unrealized capital gains yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but I, yeah, I don't know what he's suggesting here. So sorry about that. Um, yeah, nothing else. Buddy, stick it, stick around if you can, please, so you could participate in the roundtable discussion with everybody. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll definitely All be right. here. All right. And yeah, fantastic. We'll probably, Tux, I think maybe we'll try to run through the news real quick just to get all the, the stories out there, and then we'll bring everybody up, and that gives... Uh, Seth a little bit more time and the others to jump up. I don't see, I don't see uh, Francisco in the, in the back room yet or Mike. So. All right. Let's cool. do that. Thanks guys. Yeah, Thanks body as always. Thank you body.